alcune comunicazioni prima del prossimo talk. Vi ricordo di controllare il programma online perché il programma del pomeriggio è stato, ha ricevuto delle lievi modifiche e quindi... Parola a Anna Ravenscroft con il suo talk How Your Brain Tricks You. Prego. Grazie. Buongiorno. Can everyone hear me okay? Great. This talk will be in English. I'm sorry. Okay. Before we begin the rest of the talk, I want to have you for an experiment later. That's my pack, go ahead. Remember these words, okay? Just a few of my favorite things. And these images. You get all that? There will be a quiz later. Okay. So, the reason for this talk is that your brain is lazy. Your brain likes to trick you. Uh, your brain actually is really, really good at pattern completion and a lot of and thinking, but it doesn't like to work hard. So it wants to limit the cognitive load, how, much, how hard it works. It uses heuristics. We all know what heuristics are. It's got limited attention. We use social cues for figuring out what we should be doing, how we should be perceiving things. And we project. We'll talk about what all of those mean more. Okay, heuristics, automatic pattern completion. This is how your brain decides what it's looking at, how your brain decides what it's perceiving. And it bases it on mental models and prototypes. So it doesn't say, oh, it, it looks and sees two ears, four feet, and a tail, and says, oh, hey, that's a dog, by completing the prototype that it's got in its head. Availability. Uh, politicians rely on availability. Name recognition. They want to make sure that you know who they are, so when you're out there voting, you think of their name and go, oh, I, I've heard of him, so I'll vote for him. Confirmation bias, this is another heuristic that your brain uses. We'll talk about what that means. So mental models, this is one of my favorite stories. This was an actual letter to the editor in a paper. A lot of deer get hit by cars west of Crown Point on US 231, that's a highway in the US. There's too many cars to have the deer crossing here. The deer crossing sign needs to be moved to a road with less traffic. <coughs> now, this is an example of a faulty mental model because they are confusing attentii cervi with passaggio pedonale and thinking that this sign is here to tell the deer this is where you should cross. We all have mental models. We use them with the web all the time. We all know what the back button does. And if you create an app that has a back button or something that looks like a back button and it doesn't work that way, you're messing with people's mental models. Pattern matching is a powerful thing. This is how our brain perceives the world. 
There's some examples of things that it does that it should be doing, but that can also mess up how you perceive. So generalizing. You generalize all of your perceptions and all of your memories and, and get, develop those prototypes. You see things that aren't there. You're filling in the blanks off regularly. And we do stereotyping. We'll talk about this. So perception. Which yellow line is larger, the top or the bottom? Top? Yeah. They're actually the same size, but because of perspective, it looks larger to us. This is because our brain in the real world sees things moving away from us. And for that yellow line to be that size there, it must be larger. How many people see four triangles here? One there? It isn't really there, but we see it. We see one there. You may see one there. And inside the Pac-Man thing, the three Pac-Men, you'll see a triangle. Our brain, this is normal, our brain fills in the spaces. And you see cute little doggies, little white doggies. Oh, very cute little white doggies. And so, when you see the two white ears and the tail, behind the brick wall, you see the white doggy, or maybe a white cat. But because you were primed to see white doggies, you may have assumed there was a white doggy back there. You're probably able to just read this automatically without even thinking about it, because it looks like letters, so you read it. That's expectations will affect your perception. An example for me is, um, this is a walk sign, we all recognize it. In the US, this is a don't walk. So when I see this, what I actually perceive is this. It's a person, therefore it's a walk sign, not a don't walk, so I walk Oops, not so good in Italy. Um, recent, last week we were looking for uh, tickets for the train. We were looking for a tabaccaria. I haven't been in Italy for six months, but I knew to look for the big blue tea. And I was looking at this thing and heading toward there, looking to buy tickets for the tabaccaria, thinking that I was seeing this. Alex had to point out to me that that's not what you were seeing. Availability. I mentioned that name recognition is big. The more you hear about things, the more stronger connections your brain makes between those cues and that thing. Anchoring is an example of availability bias. Is this still working? OK. So, uh, we had it last night. Uh, I have a question. Uh, what percentage of African countries do you think are more or less than 10%? Okay. What percentage do you think? And you. Uh, more or less than 90%. Okay, what percentage do you think? Okay, so they are an example of geeks because they are not using anchoring. <laughs> <laughs> it's, okay, I thought this was not working so well. Typically, I think it's on. Is it on? Do you hear me? Can you 
hear me okay? Okay. So typically in studies, uh, the one who ha heard 10% would estimate closer to maybe 30%. The one who heard 90% might estimate closer to 60%. Because of the number that you heard to start with, will base our estimates on those numbers. This also happens when we're thinking about inflation, the cost of things. We're basing that on what our most recent experience is. So if you're buying petrol, you know just how expensive it is compared to the last time, and you judge based on that. Stereotyping. I have a stereotype of pythonistas. I automatically, when I hear someone's a Pythonista, assume that they're going to be smart and friendly. This is a stereotype, but it's based on my experiences with Pythonistas. Everyone stereotypes. We all stereotype about things every day, about people, about uh, everything. It's part of pattern completion. There are negative stereotypes. So for example, it's not uncommon for women at programming conferences to be asked, oh, are you so-and-so's girlfriend? Are you here, are you a recruiter? Because there aren't as many women at programming conferences, it's stereotyping to think that they are not programmers. Negative stereotyping can be overcome with awareness. If you work with women programmers, you're aware that women are good programmers. So you are more likely to assume that the women here are fellow programmers, our colleagues. Blind auditions help. Uh, what this means is symphonies were trying to increase the diversity in their symphonies. Uh, more black musicians, more women musicians. And they were having trouble with this, and they couldn't figure out why. So what they did was they put a screen and had the musicians audition, play their music behind the screen. So nobody could see them. They could only judge based on the music. And suddenly, their hiring of women and black musicians went up because they were able to disrupt the automatic stereotyping that their brains were doing. So, everybody remember the list of words that we had at the beginning? What I want you to do is raise your hand if you saw this word on the, in the beginning. Okay, ready? This was the actual list. Candy, we talked about primacy is the first thing that you heard, you'll remember. The last thing you heard, you'll remember. Primacy and recency. Cookie was not on the list. <laughs> Cookies was. Sweet was not on the list, and neither was Dolce. <coughs> Those are examples of what's called gist memory, a generalization of all of those wonderful sweet things. So your brain automatically says, oh, of course that was on the list because they were all sweet things. You're not thinking about that. Your brain's just automatically doing that. This is a common thing that your brain does to you. Other common false memories are source attribution errors. So if you park a car or a bicycle at when you're going to work or to school and you have to park every day, how many times have you gone out and gone, wait, was that where I parked today or was it where I parked yesterday? And sometimes you may misremember where you parked. Um, suggestibility. When 
police are taking witness statements, it's really easy for them to accidentally cause the witness to remember things that didn't happen, to remember things that weren't there. Did the car stop at the stop, stop, at the stop sign suggests to the person that there was a stop sign and they will remember there being a stop sign. Whether there was a yield sign, a stop sign, or no sign at all. So wit witness testimony is terrible. It's useless. Thought or deed. Now, everybody sees this beautiful green tree. Now, I want you to close your eyes and imagine a beautiful green tree. Now open your eyes. I want you to raise your hand. Come on. Put your hand down. Close your eyes and imagine raising your hand. Okay, open your eyes. Don't go to sleep on me. <laughs> In your brain, back here is where you process visual information. So that tree that you saw, you process back there. Guess what? That's the same area that fires when you imagine that tree. This area, the motor cortex, processes motor movement. That's the same area that fires when you imagine movement. They've done studies with athletes and mental work, the mental imagining of uh, mental practicing of moves actually is as effective, if not more so, than actually physically practicing those moves. So imagining the movement actually causes your brain to fire in the same ways, many of the same ways as when you did it. What does that mean to programmers? It means we have to wonder, did I actually fix that duplicate code? Or did I just think real hard about it? When will our brain trick us? If there's interruptions, if there's distractions, if there's multitasking, if you're Skyping with your buddy or on IRC <coughs> while you're working on your code, if you got a lot of duplicate code, you may fix one of the bugs and you might think real hard about the other, but you might miss <coughs> making that change. Why DRY, like Alex was talking about. Don't repeat yourself. Okay, everybody remember the images that I showed you at the very beginning and said to remember? Okay, raise your hand if this was on the... This is the actual images that I told you to remember. <coughs> this was not on that list. This was in the story that I told you about me mistaking this. This wasn't on the list either, but I saw some hands go up and I saw some people thinking about raising their hands. This was from the story that I told you, and the picture, you saw the picture of the deer standing next to this. This wasn't anywhere. You haven't seen this at all, but I saw some hands go up. Now why would hands go up for this? You have Italian domestic animal warning, and the story about attenti ai cervi, and your brain combines that to say, oh, hey, I saw one of these. Your brain loves to trick you like that. Okay, pick a card, any card. No. Um, the rule is that if a card has a vowel, everybody knows the vowels, I, A, E, O, U. Okay. If the card has a vowel, the other side must be an even number. So, which card do you need to turn over to test the rule? Now, obviously, you have to test A. 
to find out if it has a vowel. If it was a three, it would be obvious that the rule was broken. What other cards do you need to test the rule? How about B? How about four? How about seven? You said four, which a lot of you did. It's an example of confirmation bias. There's no rule that says that a consonant cannot be on the other side of a even number. So if we turned that over and it was a B, that wouldn't break the rule. But a lot of people will test to see if it's a vowel. The one you have to actually turn over is a 7 to find out whether there is a vowel or not. In your testing, in your unit tests, you need to make sure that you're not falling prey to confirmation bias and you're not just testing to demonstrate that it works, but also to test to, to find out whether it breaks. That's where edge cases, corner cases come in. Attention, we don't multitask anywhere as well as we think we do. Our attention is a limited resource. We can do one thing at a time. So let's see if I can get to, whoop. the right place with this. Sorry, it's hard to find the. All right. How do I get? Alex, help. Ah, there. Okay. Yes, you did. You were great. All right. So, make it go. Come on, go, 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 go. Ah, there we go. All right. Count the number of passes of the basketball that the white players do. And if you've seen this before, don't say anything. OK, how many passes did you count? How many people saw the gorilla? <laughs> 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 Your attention is on the uh, other stuff. You may not see the gorilla. Whoop. How do I make it go? Oh, Alex. Make it go. Oh, there. A menu file, right? Yeah, I'm trying to get to where I. Yeah, sorry. I can't see it. Ah, there. The uh, play, there. Sorry, the double screen makes it hard to see. Okay. So, selective attention. Okay. Change blindness. It's really hard to see changes when they're separated by time or when they're separated by distance. So, this also affects whether you can see errors. This is why diffs are so important. Um, how many people noticed some errors on here? Okay. You probably noticed two ats or maybe two twos because they're next to each other. You may not have noticed the two r's because they're separated by distance. Now, there's going to be two pictures that are alternating. I want you to raise your hand once you see what the <coughs> difference between the two pictures is. OK? All right, we got a couple of them. So now that they're next to each other, maybe some more can see. Now they're right next to each other. Now it's circled. 
Now, once you've seen it, you can't not see it ever again, but it's common because this is a canal. You're looking down at the canal. You're not looking up there. This happens all the time when you have web pages that somebody's filling out a form and suddenly nothing happens when they hit submit. Well, they're not looking up there. They're looking down at the submit and not seeing that you've got some message up there for them saying, uh, hello, you, miss, you forgot to put something in. So you need to direct their eye back up there. Looking or show the message down. Or sh better yet, show the message where they're going to be looking. Speaking of looking, we look at each other for cues. Now, if you see a tail in the bushes, and you look at your people next to you in your tribe, and they're scared, you better start running because it might be a tiger that's coming out to eat you. This is why we look to others for cues. It's evolutionary. It's important for us for survival. But we also look, and if we see others sitting around going, ah, it's fine, then we're not going to run. Look at it. We use each other to figure out how to interpret the environment around us. Now, if this was a totally dark room, that spot of light would look like it's moving. How far it's moving varies by the individual. So for you, it might be moving three centimeters. For you, five centimeters. But it will look like it's moving. It's called the autokinetic effect. When you're in a room alone and you see that, and the researchers ask you, OK, how far is this point moving? After a while, it's like, OK, well, that one's moving three centimeters, or whatever your individual view is. But when you put them in a group, it's very common for the estimates all to move toward the group norm. So if the group norm was five, your estimate might move to four. And subjects claim, I'm not being influenced by the group. But when they are alone in the dark room the next time, they're going to say four, not three. So I want some help. How about you four? I want you to tell me, and I'm going to ask you one at a time, which line matches the line on the left, OK? So how about you on this one? OK. How about this one? And how about this one? OK. We're geeks. We, we don't fall for this. But it's common in studies for when there are to be three or more surrounded by the incorrect answer, when three or more Confederates saying the incorrect answer, there is an incorrect response on 32%. And 75% of participants caved at least once. They said the wrong answer at least once because they were surrounded by other people who were giving the right answer. Maybe they didn't want to mess up this experiment. And so they were taking their cues from the people next to them. Factors affecting whether the person will actually conform if there's four or more people, chances are the person's more likely to conform. If it's anonymous and you can write your answer, it's less likely to conform. And if there's one dissenter in the group, one person speaks up and says, no, it was A, then the other person feels free to answer the correct answer. E take cues from other people without even realizing it. And without realizing that everybody else is doing the same thing. So if you put a bunch of people in a room and start filling it with smoke, 
If they're alone in the room, they're going to go find the experimenter and say, uh, there's smoke in the room. But if you've got more than three people in that room, it's less likely for anyone to go and tell the uh, experimenter that there's smoke in the room. Now, some of this might be thinking, well, somebody else will help. Somebody else will do it. But some of it is that others' behavior is a cue. If nobody else is reacting, it must not be a problem. And so I'm not going to do anything. Group think. How many people have done brainstorming? A lot of people. The classic way of doing brainstorming, you sit down at a table and you start brainstorming, throwing out ideas and you know, kind of building on each other's ideas and using them at a, as a uh, springboard for doing other cool stuff. What they found, though, is that the ideas converge very quickly to the earliest and loudest of the ideas. So they've suggested that instead you have people think about it on their own first, write down their ideas, come to the meeting with those ideas, and go around the whole room first to hear everyone's ideas before you start springboarding. And also surface diversity, someone who looks different from you, whether that's uh, gender or color or nationality or whatever will help to break the group think it'll help to break the assumption that everyone is like me. Everyone's thinking the same as me. Help break that group think. We tend to assume, we use ourselves as a model when we're trying to figure out how will someone else think about this? How will someone else feel about this? And this matters to us as programmers because you are not the user. You can't guess. The more different from you that your users are, the less you can guess how they're going to need, what they're going to need <coughs> and how they're even going to perceive the app that you're giving them. If you're programming for a single mom with two kids or a grandfather with 18 grandkids and you're not one of those people, you don't have anybody like that on your team, you're going to need to have a user who can represent that perspective in order for you to properly understand how they're going to perceive your app, how they're going to, what, what needs they have, what things they want to achieve. So we're going to end here. I've got a few suggestions for how to keep in mind that your brain is going to trick you. Use diversity to reduce groupthink, increase the alternative perspectives so that you can make sure things work for more people. When, when Python was only a US project, we didn't have much Unicode support. When we started getting more people international, amazingly, they needed Unicode. So suddenly, Python now has Unicode support and is a better language because of it. So this is why we want to increase diversity and increase those alternative perspectives and needs so that we can have a better language, better products. Use pair programming and code reviews to avoid things like your brain tricking you into seeing things that are not there, into missing things that are there, the two does, the two don't rely on your memory. Your memory sucks. Use bug trackers. Use version control systems. Don't repeat yourself. Write and automate tests. Don't prove that it works. Try to break it. Get somebody else to try to break it, because it's your code. So they're probably more likely to be able to think of ways to break it. Document your code and your change lists because you can't assume that the maintainer, the next person who's coming there, even if that's you in the future, that they'll understand why that change was made, why the code was written that way. 
have real users do user testing and do it early, release early, release often. The users, the real users will have perspectives that you won't. And put important information where the user is currently looking or direct the eye to where they need to look. But most important, don't trust your brain. We're done. Thank you. And amazingly, we actually have some time for questions. So. Domande? <laughs> of course. <laughs> on the uh, don't rely on your memory uh, meme, what do you think about checklists? Do you think they limit your creativity or do you think they direct it usefully or what? Yeah, I know there's a big movement about checklists and everything and I wonder about your opinion. Well, I teach uh, emergency preparedness back in Sunnyvale and one of the things that we do is hand out checklists and recommend that people put up checklists by the door because the more stress that you are under, the less likely you're going to be remembering all of the things that you need to do. Uh, airline pilots use checklists because even though they've done the same procedure over and over again, its chances are that they may miss something at some point. Checklists, remember the thing where um, did you think actually do it or did you think about it real hard? The more often you've done something, the more chances are that you'll misremember whether you actually did it or whether you just thought you did it. And whether that's because you thought about it or because you did it last time, so maybe this time you didn't remember to do it. Checklists are really useful for that. In my opinion, they really help to avoid those false memories of whether I did it or not and help to deal with any kind of situation of stress. Um, deadlines. Deadlines can put you in stress and you may forget things that you were going to do. So I use them a lot and recommend them highly. Other questions? Altre domande? What, what do you think about uh, Pomodoro techniques to improve concentration? I use something called Focus Booster on my computer so that I work for, you know, 15, 25 minutes and then I take a short break. Uh, so for me, I find it useful um, not just for improving concentration but also for overcoming procrastination because I know I can do anything for 15 minutes. So if I know that I'm going to get a break in 15 minutes because my computer's going to ping at me, then I'm more likely to start doing the thing that I was procrastinating about. Um, I also use it when I'm looking at Facebook or uh, Reddit or <laughs> other sites that are time sinks so that I don't get caught into okay, it's been three hours and I've been looking at these really cute cat videos, but I was supposed to get work done. So um, those kinds of things are helpful to me. Some people use them very fruitfully, others don't, but I like them. What uh, do you think about people listening music while uh, coding? Uh, music actually, um, the question is about whether to use music while coding. Music, if it doesn't have words, I find very helpful. If it does have words, I tend to start listening to the words and that distracts me. Other people don't have that problem. It can affect your ability to focus. If it's something you're very, very familiar with, then it can be background noise and help you avoid the other noises outside, um, but if it's not something you're really, really familiar with, I would suggest maybe instrumental music to cover all of the other distractions. 
over there. Uh, there's no time. Aw, oh, one last question. Um, we have two not. minutes. <laughs> no, that's it's 12.08, we got two minutes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Come on, I finished early. Uh, but because of the problem you've shown, it, it, it means that in our, I mean, artificial intelligence will be better than our brain? Uh, <laughs> artificial intelligence uh, runs into some of the same problems because it uses some of the same heuristics. So I don't know that it would necessarily be better unless the programmer was very aware of those things and tried to figure out, okay, so how do I avoid that problem? I don't know. That, you'll have to ask the AI people that. Maybe Danielle or, or, uh, uh, or uh, I don't know your name. Gloria. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, I, I got a couple machine learning people here, AI people, so, okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you.